We've started, oh, nice and loud, thanks boys. <laughs> so the morning started off quite cool this morning. Did anyone else feel a bit of a chill in the air? Yeah, all the cold frogs, that's awesome. But, um, after I just want to just show, share a little bit of light about what's been happening in the life of the church. Yesterday the deacons and our elder sat for five hours, ten hours, whatever it was, eight hours yesterday meeting with Mark Westland from QB to get their heads around the spiritual appointment and um, some goals for the church and some uh, how that um, and the ministry of the pastor, of myself in the church as well. So it was a great day. I, I came for the last four hours so I got off easy in that regard but it was good just to sit and listen to things and ponder over things. And so at the end of that, we have a spiritual appointment, which we'll work on the next few weeks. While I'm away, no doubt, when I come back, we'll have something there. And then um, work on me going back to point eight. So basically four days a week, roughly. We'll work out how that looks as well. But we need to be continually in prayer. But I just want to say to the deacons who sat there yesterday for all that time, pondering over these things, heads full of things, I really appreciate the effort you guys put in. So thank you very much, wherever you are. One, two, three. And... Lorna, where are you, Lorna? Oh, there you are, quietly, sitting quietly there. But yeah, really appreciate it. Annette as well, up the back there. Thanks, Ed. So it just, you know, I came in and everyone seemed to be in a good headspace, which was good, but I uh, knew that, uh, that it did, to me, those things can take a while to get your head around. So appreciate it very much. So please be in prayer and continue to be in prayer for our leaders as we go forward into the future now and see what God's going to do in this space. So we've been working through um, our discipleship series after the last several weeks. I mean, Caleb has been preaching as well from um, the I Am series. But it's about, um, the main thing is about keeping us in the, present in the occasion. And that was the first step of, of us learning how to be evangelists is how to be the person that's present, that God puts into that place to help people to understand about the gospel and to bring the gospel to people. We looked at Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well and, and the process he went through with that. And it, it's good to actually have a bit of a blueprint to work off and say, okay, this is what it looks like. And so if I am in that situation, I too can able, might be able to do it that way. It's about equipping the saints. He, we, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the, um, the rich young man and how, again, an interaction with Jesus was about him sharing the kingdom of heaven, the guy asking what it means to be, have eternal life and then... When he's presented with the principles and presented with the opportunity, it was something too big for him to get his head around. And we also had a look at Philip and the eunuch and how just pre presentation of the gospel there was someone seeking. Philip was also present in this man's life. He asked the question, he talked with him, he shared the gospel, the truth and love of Jesus and then they end up being, he ended up being baptised. Today takes a slightly different understanding. We look at one of Paul's interactions. Before we go any further, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you wish that none would perish, that all would come to know you as Lord and Saviour. Father, we thank you for those in our group today, those in this church family, Lord, who can testify that you are Lord of Lord and King of Kings, that you are their Saviour. Father, we also are mindful too, Lord, of those who are seeking you, trying to work out what you're all about and what church is about and religion is about. Father, we just pray for your simple gospel truth to be known. And Father, as we have a look at this incident that occurred in the life of the church, even though it was at sea, Father, you were present. Lord, your heart's desire was to preserve. And Lord, just help us to get our heads around what that means for each of us personally. Lord, we just give you thanks and praise for that. And Lord, we pray also, Father, just as always, Father, the words that I speak will be your words, not mine. Father, just help me to be your vessel in your name. Amen. So I've got a quick question for you, and it's based on, um, on your knowledge of things, and I was wondering if anyone knows what that is. It, it's the minnow. All these people know came out in 1963 and it went for three seasons. And you know, the only reason it got taken off the air was because the person in charge of the production company, of the whole overall charge, wanted to see gun smoke in that tom slot. So Gilligan's Island got cancelled because gun smoke had to go there. And what happened to us? We didn't get any closure. They never got off the island. 
I know they made some movies later on, but actual when you're watching it as a small child as I was, come on, guys, you've got to get off this time. The big thing about it was, though, is that they were caught in a storm. And the, and the interesting characters that were assembled in the cast were people who had to weather that storm and then survive later in a shipwreck. And we're going to talk about a shipwreck now out of Scripture. There's a shipwreck in Acts 27 we're going to look at. And because of that, um, we have an understanding then perhaps that, well, in life we have shipwrecks and have storms and we have things that happen to us. And how does God work in that space? Is God present in that space as an evangelist? Is he just there for, and I use the word just, of course, he's just there to offer social support and, and that thing, or is he actually there interested in the gospel message getting through to people, even in these times of crisis? A storm can be defined as an event or a set of circumstances that take us by surprise. It can be a threat or it can be something else indeed. And so we have storms of life, and most of us have experienced storms in our life. But how does God use a storm in this situation? Acts 27 is a long chapter, and when I've been working with Caleb, we've been looking at how much of an actual passage do we read. And uh, so I don't want to say, don't want to sort of go back on what I've been encouraging you, Caleb. So I'm going to keep it short. So he's marking me today, by the way. He's got a list of things down to see if I back up what I say. So we're going to start at verse 13 and just work through to 25 for now. Just to get a sense of the storm that's happening. So when the gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they'd wanted, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head out into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed the lee of a small island called Cordia, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that it would run aground on the sandbars of Citrus. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard in their own hand, with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued to rage, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Everyone loves a know-it-all. And when you have spared yourself, you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. And last night, an angel of the Lord, who's I am, who I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep your courage, men. For I have faith in God that I will, that it will happen just as he has told me. Nevertheless, we must run around ground on some island ahead. So even though the outcome was, yeah, God's looking after, there's still things we have to do in the meantime. One of the encouraging things about this is that in amongst all this, God is there. And when you look at the, 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 um, the manifest of this ship, there's a lot to consider about what's at stake. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So it did come in halfway through the story, and I do apologise for that to some extent. In verse 9, before we started reading, there was an, an altercation between whether or not they should go ahead. And you can see, I don't know if you can make it out on the screen, but the green line here, the green line here is the tr where they were going. So they went to Sidon, Cyprus, Mauritia, Myra, sorry, across to Crete, and then across this wiggly bit where the storm hit them, and that's where God showed up and ended up in Malta. They were actually supposed to go up above Crete and sail around Acacia and go up that way, but that didn't happen because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. The circumstances were wrong, and they were in all sorts of trouble. And they feared for their lives. Even in a time of tragedy, God shows up. It reminds us too that um, 
is that you know we have our efforts to survive in life the things that happen we can almost put a parallel to in these circumstances in in verses 9 and 11 they're trying to control the outcome and paul even said then look i'm i'm asking you i'm imploring you do not set sail we'll get there in a time after the season but the centurion made the decision so the centurion and the owner of the ship made the decision based on obligation and money and so they set off then and the consequences of that were because they had the control they tried to have over everything and we always have control over the things in our lives we tried that as well then the act, then after that happens and we have an act of desperation and the act of desperation here i've summarized to secure the lifeboat frap the hull that's not frap a the hull that's frap the hull lower the sea anchor drop four anchors cut loose anchors and then see what happens so all these things i do to try and control the circumstance they are in they were men and women if you want to use the term men and women people who were just in trouble and they're trying to make sense of it all and in the midst of all this here's paul who's on his way to prison he's on his way to caesar to be presented before caesar his fourth and last trip and here he is in amongst all this so when we're in our situation where we want to survive when others are in the way they want to su- in the situation they need to survive it's a lot about cutting the cost the cost is mounting this is going to cost us too much and the cost of salvation is submission to christ and jesus by the ultimate f- sacrifice it cost him his life and sometimes when we read in there in, in um in the cost of life is that it's about the livelihood versus life they were trying to work out how they could keep both they want to keep their livelihood all their cargo and everything on board they also wanted to save their lives and that's where the tension came and they thought it was one or the other they went to great lengths to jettison the cargo and the grain that was the merchant's income and we do that ourselves don't we? we're in a crisis situation we start working what do we need to cut out is there things i need to take out of my life is there people i don't need to hang around with anymore is there something that's happening in a nebulous way that i need to get my head around because in my own strength i'm trying to survive here in my own strength i'm trying to survive and then it came to the point where even the vessel they were in was in trouble because the captain and the owner of their ship had to make decision and the crew let's start throwing things overboard it says in scripture there was 797 uh, sorry 297 people on board 297 people not just paul and a few prisoners and the centurion there was a it was a it was the modern day oriana cruise ship it was something that was happening along those lines so there was more at stake than just a few people more at stake than just a bit of cargo there was 700 there was, sorry i said it again it's 279 people on board all helpless and all in terror so what happens in that well the first thing we encourage you to do if you're thinking about training for um, uh, evangelism looking at people and opportunities for divine appointments to let people know about the scripture that's what we've been talking about for several weeks is to know the season you're in so know the season you're in what does life storm look like can you make that quickest assumption up can you just go through and assess say, well this is what the storm is one of the greatest helps and things like this is uh, is empathy if you've been through a similar situation you can speak into that situation it doesn't mean that if you haven't you can't but it's encouraging that if you have you know some of the skills the things that god has taught you i want to ask the question now what does life storm look like for you it's the first thing you need to answer how have you coped in the storms of your life is it a case of saying well yeah no i trusted in god faithfully the whole way or would you go, oh no, oh, well, we sort of lost it a bit there and tried to control it. That's okay. That's okay. Well, there are consequences for your decision. So when you're trying to control it and the storm's happening, has there been a consequence you weren't prepared for? And how has God taught you through that? So you can empathise with someone and say, look, you know, I hear what you're saying. I just, is there some way I can just relate what's happened to me? One of the rules of counselling is you listen and you don't try and solve the person's problem just keep asking questions and the other one is don't put yourself in their place and say oh when my situation happened like this or yeah you've got to stand back but that empathy gives you a heart to understand and if god has taught you something 
And you've got to work out, okay, Lord, how can I help this person in their storm? We've got to work on the size of that font. Or get my need new glasses. We've got to make a decision whether to rest or forge ahead. When things are going really bad, do we do? We rest or forge ahead? We're going on a caravan holiday. Now we've had to, because of school holidays, we haven't done this in school holidays for a long time, is book ahead. And I'm reluctant to book ahead because I know something might go wrong on the road. And you might end up camping beside the road for a night. Or you see a particularly lovely spot beside a billabong and you think, this is a cool spot, I want to stop here the night. And you can't, I've committed to the next stop because I've already booked into a caravan park or the like of that. But do you rest or do you forge ahead? Do you rest in God or do you forge ahead in your own strength? And what did it look like for you in that case? Life circumstances and situations versus reaction and responses. That's how you have to weigh it up. I just want to encourage you at this point, if this sounds like a lecture, I do apologise. But I'm trying to get you into a head spot to say, well, okay, what does God do in a tragedy and in a storm? How is God present in there? My first call is to help people, is to be social justice for them in that regard. But also, the gospel is important because that's how people are saved. One of the big things that went through the Salvation Army several years ago was they went from their social justice doctrine to just helping people and realising after all these years that in the context in Australia was time that the gospel actually was part of that social, social justice action. So then there started to be a gospel element to what they were doing. Not that they didn't care or didn't love them and didn't want to see them saved. It was just that the pure doc document they used was being transformed into a document that said, okay, we can give you food and shelter. Do you know why we're giving you food and shelter? Because God loves you and he wants you to know him personally as your Lord and Saviour. It was a big change. And it changed lives. And we come to church and we learn about things and we pray and we have communion and we think about how, what it means to us. But folks, there are people going to hell out there that don't know Jesus. And we need to be motivated. We need to let them know that Jesus loves them. We can't just say, well, evangelistic situation occurs here. Because it occurs anywhere we are where God puts us. And in a storm is one of those. In amongst tragedy and circumstances. And Philippians 4.19 gives us this encouragement. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God will meet your needs. He won't probably meet, most likely meet what you think you need, but he will meet your needs. In Psalm 142 it says to these words listen to my cry for i am desperate need rescue me from those who pursue me for they are too strong for me we know folk like that in our world one of the great joys we have is that we live in the world as we come across people every day we interact with people every day no man's an island and if we take the gospel into the world, we need to be able to recognise those divine circumstances. And Paul found himself right in the middle. My pulpit is shrinking. My Bible might be too heavy. Ah, there we go. To remember not to... I'm bending further and further down, Richard. Did you play a joke on me? <laughs> Caleb had it last week. Uh, the pupil turns on the master. Revenge is sweet, he says. In verses 21 to 25, I'll just read them again. And after the men had gone a long time without food, they were desperate, they were broken, they were hungry, probably seasick because they'd been battling for 11 days. This storm had been raging for 11 days. It wasn't just a storm that you get out in Moreton Bay. It was a storm that went for 11 days and blew them hundreds of kilometres off course. They were sick as dogs. And after they'd gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken something, taken my advice back in Crete. Then you will have spared yourselves this damaging loss. But now I urge you to keep your courage, because I am the one, not, because not one of you will be lost. He stood up with such confidence and courage. He took the bull by the horns. He stood up with passion. Men, I tell you now, 
The last time I came across such passion was reading the Facebook feed Thursday morning after the State of Origin win. And I looked at a few clips online, the crowd in the background, and saw the passion of people. If only we had that much passion for Jesus. Can you imagine what the world would be like? So much passion. And he stood and he spoke. He spoke words of assurance as God has got this. I need to let you know that even all this is happening, we're going to help you. We're going to help you repair that broken down car. We're going to help you find a new place to live. We're going to help you with a fridge or a freezer. We're going to help you with food. But you need to know that God loves you. He wants to know you personally. God is in the midst of your storm. And John 14, 14 to 15 says these words. And it's, it's echoing what Paul is saying here. I know God and God knows me. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you, I no longer call you servants, but a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. Did you realize that? That you actually have the gospel inside you? That you've known the gospel yourself because you're saved? And that you can actually pass that gospel on to other people because you've already got it inside you? You don't have to learn anything. All you have to do is be there. And so I know God and God knows me and he wants to know you personally. And I want to encourage you with those words. And he's, he's an honest man of nothing else because he said, I've got to go to prison. I've got to go to, well, he didn't say that. He said, I've got to go to see Caesar. So I've got to get to my appointment with the king, no matter what that looks like. Now, a lesser man might have said, well, I'm just going to jump ship with everybody else. So I'm going to take the lifeboat and go. But he knew he had to see out his course. Now, if there's any encouragement, I always find this very sobering words in 1 Timothy 5, 15 and 16. Here is a trustworthy saying. Paul wrote this to Timothy to encourage him in Ephesus. That deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But he goes on to say, for this very reason I was shown mercy. That in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience as an example of those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Can anyone else, rhetorical question, empathise with those words? Do they hit a strike a heart, a chord in your heart? Sitting with someone who's got, been through a tragedy, through times that are tough, through the storm in their life, God can be present there because one of his servants is there. I'm not perfect. I've got the things that have gone wrong, well, but you know, he saved me. And because he saved me, I know I can save you. Your circumstances might be the same, but inside you'll be saved. You'll know Jesus as Lord and Saviour. We know that the hope is real because these people are in a hopeless situation. We have to go to the other side of the coin. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into the hearts, into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And there's security in Christ in John 10, 28 and 29. I give them eternal life, said Jesus, and they shall never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who gives them to me, has given to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. If anyone needs assurance in the storm of their life, they need to know they're safe. They're safe in the hands of Jesus. But the big question is, do you feel safe in the hands of Jesus? Can you claim that truth from John? That, yeah, I'm one of his and I'm, he's no, no one's going to snatch me out of his hand. Because that's how we speak hope into people's lives, how we speak encouragement to their lives. And in the midst of the storm, Paul stood up in amongst the deck heaving up and down, bits flying off the ship everywhere, people throwing up over the side, people's crying and screaming. He, said, he did start off saying, I told you so, but after that, he did say, God has got this. Trust me, God has got this. He's done it for me before, he'll do it for you under new circumstances. If we learn anything about evangelism in our discipleship class the last several weeks, I need you to understand that from your heart, that God has got it. And he'll give you the words to say in the circumstances. In this case, this is what Paul had to say. 
Years ago, I got led to this saying that sort of imprinted itself on my understanding and it really helps me to see things and I share it with people from time to time. But it's quite a simple phrase and it says this, the price is paid, the promise is given, Jesus is with me 24-7. I wonder if we could all say it together, just to make me feel good. The price is paid, the promise is given, Jesus is with me 24-7. Imagine you're sitting beside someone in the gutter and they're really struggling. God's led you to that person and they say, I just don't understand. Can I just say something to you right now? I just want to share you something God taught me. The price is paid, his promise is given and he's with me 24-7 and that's what keeps me going. I'm no better than anyone else but I'm going to just share that with you. Just to give them hope. And you know, things went the way they did because in verse 44, which we didn't read but I'll read it now, because I didn't want to go down that track of reading miles and miles of scripture, getting one lost. In verse 44 it says this, after they'd worked out what they were going to have to do and they got things into place, it says in verse 44, the rest were to get there on planks and on pieces of the ship. In this everyone reached the land in safety. The promise was that I would make you safe, says God. I can't guarantee all your possessions are going to get there, but I'll get you there. And that's the whole point of heaven, is that we will get there just with what we have, not with anything we can take with us. Sometimes we're so attached to the things of this world that everything else grows strangely dim and we need to look into the Saviour's face. I'm sure there's a song about that somewhere. So even in the life of the storm, God is present because his people are present. God is present because you are present in those lives. We're present when we have words of calm to give. Don't incite the riot or create hysteria, but have words of calmness to share with people. To have words of hope. I've got a hope that I have in Christ. I want to share that hope with you. And words of confidence. We take anything from Paul. As wild as a man he was, he was very confident of the scriptures and very confident of his salvation. And that's, people love that. They love when you're positive about it. I think Richard tapped on it before about saying, well, look, you know, we remember the table because that shows us the sacrifice that Christ made for us. And he says, to do this in remembrance of me until I come again. So we live that life in victory. That we have the hope in Christ. We are confident of our salvation. And we're confident people need to know that as well. It's really a part of putting people on a pathway. If we look at the Engel scale, which I showed a few, showed a few weeks ago, it goes from people not knowing anything about God at all down the bottom in number 10, man's response. And I believe that when Paul was speaking on the deck of that ship, it was heaving everywhere, that it's probably about there, introducing God to them. Not every person here today will have the opportunity or the understanding or even the inclination or even the what happens to be able to say, do you want to pray the prayer? And they say, yes, I want to pray the prayer. Your role might be introduce God to them in the storm. While it's all happening, you are God's person there. Last slide and we'll close in prayer. I talked about commencing a pathway and and I've been thinking about this for a while and what it means, but we know about you know, people on a pathway to God because the higher up you go, the angle scale, the more people become connected to church and become connected to God, connected to church, connected to each other and just keeps working that way. It's sort of like this, that we use God's word to teach us in discipleship about what it means to share Christ. We reach out to those who don't know Jesus. And they give their heart to God and worship him. And the next thing they find is they start to fellowship with those who also love Jesus and get encouraged and taught and grown and challenged. And they serve. They serve Jesus. Every person that you encounter has worth in the kingdom of heaven. I want to encourage you with that. If you have opportunities, take those opportunities. Just like Paul, the storm in that ship, he stood there and he declared that God has got control of this. 
and he wants those people to understand that dearly. Later on, he gets bitten by a snake and he shakes it off and they wait for him to die. Yeah, they're a morbid bunch. And they're waiting for him to die and he doesn't die and he said, because God has been in control of this situation. And they all went, oh, this God must be pretty cool. A bit more up the angle ladder. It's creeping up slowly. But it takes time. Don't give up. Richard is absolutely poised to pounce up here. Let me pray, Richard. Unless you've got a word of testimony to share, brother, how Jesus has changed your life. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that in all the things that have happened in our lives, you have been there. Lord, before we knew you as Lord and Saviour, most of us can testify to saying, I could just something happens there. Someone said something to me when I was 15 and I was 10. Lord, I thank you for those folk. I thank you, Lord, they were obedient, Lord, that they were prompted by your spirit and they were also bold in sharing. Lord, give us that same passion and fervour. Lord, that we will be a people of your heart. Lord, to reach the lost, to encourage people to find you. Lord, not just to introduce them to you, but Lord, help them to accept you as Lord and Saviour. There's no other way into the kingdom of heaven unless we are saved and born again. Father, just thank you for each person here today. Lord, I pray, Lord, empower your spirit. Lord, give them eyes to see what you see so, Father, they can share. Lord, be present. Help them to be present in people's lives. And, Lord, when it comes to situations where people have storms and tragedies, help us, Lord, to be present there as well. Lord, we just give you thanks and praise that you didn't abandon any of us. Lord, just thank you for this in your name. Amen. I assure you, I wasn't trying to Doug, move Doug on. It's just much better for the back. I tend to slouch. We're going to close with a, I guess you'd call it a bit of a modern day hymn. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. So if you'd like to stand, we'll sing this one together.
long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory. as we go out into this week we acknowledge that it's not us but it's Christ in us and Lord help us to share the victory of that life of having you in us Amen Welcome to stay and have a cuppa in the room around